off the... Where is it? I think I'm... Michael and I couldn't find it. No? Oh. No? Yes. Okay. I guess now I have a microphone. Okay, that's better. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the second section, which is on applications and regulations. George has asked me to announce um, if you want to have dinner here, you have to pay for the tickets by four o'clock at the registration desk. It's chicken fried steak. No? At the hotel, sorry. The hotel, the hotel registration, not the conference registration. Okay, so by four o'clock, it's chicken fried steak, and I believe it's at 6.30. Is that correct? Okay. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce the first speaker is Catherine McElhaney. She's a research associate in the Food and Environmental Microbiology Lab at Texas A&M University. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to kind of veer off in a whole different direction than we've kind of been talking about, and that's talking about food safety and how it relates to. So if it seems like I'm veering off topic, it's because I am. But I think that it's important to understand the big picture and to understand that all of this is very much intertwined. So just to give you a little out uh, outline of uh, what I'm talking about, a little bit about uh, food in the environment, and then applications for source tracking in foods, uh, methods, uh, some of the regulations that are involved have a big impact on the industry. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about viruses, because um, when you get to food and foodborne outbreaks, viruses are very important, but they're often overlooked. And then finally, some, um, some final thoughts, things to think about, something like that. So, um, source tracking is largely focused on identifying sources of bacteria in the environment. And in a large part over the last couple of years, um, I said the last decade or so, uh, food has kind of taken this area and built upon it. But the two fields are very much linked. We were talking about earlier about irrigation water. There's a lot of other areas as well. Um, a lot of the food work developed from work in the environmental field. Uh, a lot of the tools that are being used, and a lot of the industry utilize these tools. So this is an overview. Uh, this is the most recent estimate of foodborne pathogens in the United States, and how many people are affected by illnesses. So you can see salmonella is at the top, over a million, but you see the top bacterial is up here. We have viral down here. So whether it's salmonella, we have over a million estimated, norovirus is over five million. Um, a lot of people don't realize Clostridium perfringens is a large source uh, of foodborne pathogen, Campylobacter, E. coli, etc. So, input factors. What are the input factors? Okay, sorry. I need to talk a little louder, apparently. Um, input factors into food. How do pathogens get into food? So you have um, animal sources, direct contamination. This can be, um, you know, birds, deer. There have been cases of uh, wild hogs influencing contamination in fields, stuff like that. You also have manure. If you have pathogens in manure that's applied to crops, that can contaminate the food. Um, irrigation water, as talked about earlier, is also a large source. And also wash water. Um, if, depending on what, a lot of times crops are pulled from the field and they're washed. Depending on if those are contaminated. And a lot of times, even if you bring in contaminated products from the field and place them in clean wash water, a lot of, it can able to replicate and it can affect other things. Um, and the last source, of course, I think this is the most common one. This is people focus on is people. So you're handling it, you're picking it, you're processing it, thing and preparation. In the restaurant, you bring the product home and you're cooking it to eat. So looking at some of the same organisms I just showed you, um, so these are all common sources of foodborne illness. And listed here is the reservoir in the environment. So several of them are humans, several of them are a variety of poultry, pigs, Campylobacter, uh, Clostridium perfringens, Salmonella, of course we know, you know, E. coli. It's usually associated with cattle, but really any ruminant. And then this is sort, you know, um, transmission. How can that be organism be transmitted into food? So, you know, um, 
For example, E. coli is usually associated with cattle, but if someone's infected with E. coli and they touch something without cooking it, that can just as easily transfer. So you can't always determine one source for contamination. Applications for source tracking in food. Um, so the biggest one, and I think this is the one that everyone kind of thinks about, is outbreak response. This is, you know, the big one. The CDC gets involved. All the different organizations gets involved. Um, but there's other elements as well. There's product quality and control. This is a very emerging field. It's really new. A lot of people don't know exactly what to do with it, but I think it's going to take some interesting courses in the next um, couple of years. And then, of course, there's research, understanding how these, um, and I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more. So, um, oops, sorry. Foodborne outbreaks. This is, um, I'm sure a lot of you probably already know this, but um, just from a food perspective, uh, the CDC is the one that collects data on foodborne illness. They're the ones that are responsible for collecting data, presenting it. Um, they do it from you know, across the whole United States through the foodborne disease um, surveillance system. And just you know, so you know, a foodborne outbreak is defined as two or more cases of similar illness resulting from ingestion of a common food. So that they've matched two or more illnesses and know that an outbreak has taken place. So, talk a little bit about the first one, outbreak response and trace back. How does source tracking play into this? And you might think of source tracking a little bit differently when it applies to food. I mean, you're gonna have to change your perspective just a little bit, but the main ones is identifying the food. If you can take a specimen from an infected patient and match it to a pathogen on a food product, then you have a link. Um, and you can use that to move forward. So this can allow a recall of the food product, which would hopefully would prevent further illness in people. Um, you can also identify the scope of the outbreak. I'm going to show uh, a slide in just a few slides that kind of brings this, um, brings this home. And you can link patients across multiple states. Now our food supply is so broad, you know, a lot of lettuce can go out and from California, it can be consumed across multiple states. So how do you link those back to a common source? Um, and then hopefully it will allow you to trace back to a source. You know, the ideal is that you could take a pathogen, identify it from a patient, trace it back to the field that it came from or, you know, the packing or whatever, and then trace that back to the environmental source. Now, that doesn't always work like that, but that is the ideal. Um, this could allow an extended recall, for example, um, if you had a lot of seeds and you know that it needs to be recalled, but maybe that, those seeds were also used in a different farm, and now they need to be aware that they're using something that's caused illness. Identifying risk factors, if there's animals around, if there's runoff, then hopefully you can trace it back. And a big one now is liability issues. It's knowing what your liability is, you know, if you caused a food point outbreak. So, I've used it as an example here, the 2011 listeria outbreak. I know a lot of you, everyone, I'm sure everyone has heard about this, this is in cantaloupe. But I wanted to use this as an example because it shows kind of how this works. So Colorado Department of Public Health notifies the CDC of seven ill with listeria. Sorry, I know y'all, I'm not talking. Just tell me if I need to talk louder. Um, uh, they're able to type three distinct fingerprints. They do interviews with patients that suggest cantaloupe, that all the patients ate cantaloupe. They collect them from retail stores and also from a home. So a patient has a cantaloupe in their fridge that I guess they ate half of or whatever. All three fingerprints are detected. So you have a, a link here to patients. The FDA collects samples from the farm that these cantaloupes are from and they're able to find the exact same fingerprints on conveyor belts, rollers, and fruits from storage. So there you have a link back to the thing. Now, like I said, in an ideal scenario, you would also be able to link this back to the source of the introduction. You would be able to say, oh, this came from field, this came from irrigation water, and a lot of times that doesn't happen, you know, because of, you know, time crunch or, I guess, you know, monetary issues, or maybe they just, um, 
don't see it as important, but they're not able, in this case, to find how it got into the packing shed. Um, so this here is a um, map that shows the overall outbreak. So this is uh, the Listeria outbreak across the entire United States, and all of these samples were matched to one another for PFG. So they know for a fact that all of these samples came from the same outbreak. But it would be very, in, very easy if you didn't have these kind of resources to just say, oh, we have a Colorado outbreak of Listeria that's just affected 39 people. But we actually have the resources to be able to look and say, no, this is much bigger than that. All right, uh, so the next application is um, product quality. And I think the most important thing to say here is that, um, and some people may disagree with me, but that food safety is not a competitive advantage in the marketplace. You don't see a bag of salad with a sticker that says, now 90% less E. coli. You know, it's just, it's not marketed to people. Um, what you do see is it's fresher, it's crisper, it has a longer shelf life. You know, these are the things people want, but they don't market food safety. Food safety to, um, to producers is mainly because of liability, and it's mainly because of regulation. So, this is a very new field. I'm going to stop by saying this, but there's some interest in using molecular tools for traceback for purposes other than food safety. And you have to remember that in food, bacteria play more than one role because there's pathogens that make people sick. There's also organisms that cause spoilage. And that's a big concern because that will decrease shelf life, causes off taste. You know, people won't buy your product if they open it up and it's spoiled. Um, so traceback in the food industry has traditionally been done with, you know, manual or digital, you know, recording who you bought your product from. But there's actually molecular methods now emerging. And um, one of them I was going to talk very briefly about is, uh, uh, this is something Dr. Ply is very interested in, is tagging with custom-designed molecular barcodes. And this is, oops. So you actually encode into mass quantities of DNA different information. And this information can be added to the packaging of the product. Right now it's often added to the packaging just because there's issues about adding DNA into a food product. Um, but the information is secure and you can record a lot of this information. Um, but this is mainly used for uh, there's quality, but the big one right now is fraud and counterfeit detection. If you have a high quality food product that you know it costs a lot of money to produce, like that, then there's going to be counterfeits. And actually, food counterfeiting is a huge issue in the food industry. This way, you can actually tag your product in a way that only you can tell if it's real or not. And also, the last one is food origin. People are interested in knowing. I mean, there's a lot of issues with um, foods coming from a specific area, allowing to have specific you know, titles or something like that. Um, and this just shows briefly how, you know, the tagging can be done at different factories, farms, and then it's analyzed um, and, you know, either accepted or rejected. Where do they put the tagging? Tag? Right, yeah, usually in the label. Or oh, in the label. So what would actually happen, in, like I said, this is very new. It's kind of being theorized, so they're not really using it, but I know there's been a couple examples like... Um, uh, they'll put it in the label, they'll scrape off a little bit of label, put it in a centrifuge tube, analyze it, and they'll say, yes, this is a real valid product, no, this is a counterfeit. Um, and the last application is uh, research, understanding transmission, understanding how pathogens get into the foods, evaluating risk. You know, if you have a field full of crops, what is your greatest impact? Is it, you know, irrigation? Is it, you know, animal input? Is it, the, you know, your people that are picking your crops? What's the greatest um, impact for food safety? And the last one is um, tracking the evolution of organisms and environmental influence. So you have food pathogens that are constantly changing all of the time. And how are they developing new traits? You know, a virulence genes adaptation. We had an outbreak of um, antibiotic resistant salmonella in Turkey, ground turkey, you know, just a few months ago. So these are things that are becoming very important. Um, like I said, mentioned earlier, a lot of the molecular methods that are used for foods were originally developed for food and water. Um, and they've kind of been 
taken over by the food industry and used for their own purposes, you might say. Um, but the food industry testing has now advanced fairly significantly. I'm not sure how you could argue about quality, but at least it's very fast and it's very easy to use because that's what people want. If you have a food industry and you have people that you've been training to test your product, you want the result fast so you can release the product and you want someone to not have to go get a PhD to be able to use it. Basically. Um, so uh, basically what I was just saying, it's, um, the most important thing is it's not just research review in the food industry. It's used by companies every day. And the, I think the main reason that it doesn't get across is because in environmental studies and in um, water quality, a lot of that work gets published. You know, it gets into reports, it gets into um, you know, publications. But in the food industry, a lot of this is done internally. It's done within companies, and so that's kept within companies, and you don't really see, you know, all of this stuff internally they're doing in source tracking, but they are. You know, they're using a lot of methods. You know, if they have a contamination product problem in a product, you know, then they can go back and look and say, um, you know, what are the different profiles? Are we getting from the same source? Is it a different source? They can go back into their plants and look and see what is the source of this contamination. And they have invested a lot of money into commercializing kits, easy to use for sampling and detection. Um, easy to use fingerprinting methods, like diverse lab are becoming very commonplace in the food industry, and not even just in pathogens. You know, um, yeast for beer brewing. You know, if you can type a specific yeast that produces a flavor profile that you want, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, and they're using all different methods. PFGE is the big one for outbreaks. It's pretty much the gold standard for foodborne outbreaks and detection. But there are other methods used, you know, like internally for quality and other issues. And uh, Dr. Pai wanted me to mention that graduate students at Texas A&M are now learning all of these methods as part of a molecular methods course. So why? Why has the food industry um, developed so much on these kind of initial um, methods for source tracking? And the main driver is regulation. Um, food regulation obviously is very developed. It's a big issue and it's influenced testing, it's influenced standardization and the coordination of different agencies, and it's influenced liability. I'm going to talk about these a little bit more. Um, so regulations mandating testing. The um, federal food regulatory authorities have declared certain pathogens, foodborne pathogens that are also found in the environment, that are also used in source tracking to be adulterants, which means that they cannot be in the food, absolutely positively, meaning that food companies have absolutely no choice but to test for them. These are E. coli 157, no, not, not 0157 E. coli, which is about to start, and uh, listeria and ready-to-eat foods. So when this started, when this was mandated, this drastically affected the frequency that was used to test and also the methods that were used. This just shows, you know, a variety of different, quick, all of this, you know, this kind of emphasis in the food industry is, is it fast? Is it easy to use? You know, you just can grow things up and test for it. And there's a variety of different methods. There's, you know, real-time PCR kits. There's, you know, ELISA. There's, I'm not sure. They think these are antibiotic-based kits. So the regulations have also, besides influencing testing, they've also influenced reporting and the standardization of methods. So. If you come down with E. coli, and you go to the doctor and they take a test and they confirm that it's E. coli, then according to regulations, they are required to report that illness to the health department or the CDC. And because they're required to report this information, there's been a great effort to standardize the methods. Um, PFGE mainly is the big one. And also to coordinate agencies. Now the coordinate agencies is really used during outbreaks. And that's a big one. I mean, going back to the Listeria example, you had the Colorado Department of Public Health, you had um, FDA did the sampling, you had the CDC that was coordinating the multiple state outbreaks. So they're very much coordinated to work together in cases of outbreaks. Well, you could argue that they're not, but fairly well. Um, and the big issue here is PulseNet. So I'm going to go into a little more. Uh, PulseNet is a national network of public health and food regulatory agencies. 
includes state health departments, it includes local health departments, it includes FDA and um, USDA, but it's all coordinated kind of by the CDC. And this is the big one that kind of um, allows people to connect outbreaks that have occurred in different states, or even, there's even polls in different countries. So, you know, it doesn't occur very often, but if you had a foodborne outbreak across multiple countries, you'd be able to trace that back. Um, so each of the participants, you get a specimen that's confirmed in the foodborne, one of the reportable foodborne pathogens, perform a PFGE analysis, and then these patterns are automatically uploaded to a CDC database. And this just kind of shows um, all the locations of PulseNet labs in the United States. So liability. Um, the Food Safety Modernization Act has also increased liability issues uh, for companies. It's encouraged fingerprinting and traceback, because uh, fingerprinting, fingerprinting can just as easily exonerate you as it can implicate you. So that's why there's been some interest. Um, and there's also been consumer pressures for the food industry to develop its own standards, own standards for water quality, own standards for irrigation water, stuff like that. There are a lot of challenges with doing um, source tracking in foods. The biggest one is, you know, give an example of fitting a loaf of bread into a microcentrifuge tube. There's a lot of inhibitors in foods. If you have a sandwich and you want to analyze it for a pathogen, do you just put the whole sandwich in there? Do you take the bread and then you take the lettuce and then you take the, you know, tomato or whatever? Um, and there's also detection limits always to deal with. Uh, in the food industry, a lot of times, unless they're looking for a specific uh, cause or contaminant, there's no um, quantitative detection. A lot of times it's plus minus. If you find salmonella, that's bad. We need to take care of that. But it's not, they don't really care how much salmonella is in there. And also, um, unless, unless you're a very, very large food company, most of the molecular testing is done in third party. And it's just because of equipment needs, it's because of personnel needs. A lot of the smaller food companies, if they need it, don't have the capability to do that. Um, so I want to change really quick and talk about viruses. Um, they're often overlooked in food and environmental, even though if you look, this is estimated total episodes of foodborne illness. 59% of foodborne illnesses are estimated to be caused by viruses. We know very little about how and where viruses get into our foods. A lot of people assume that it's handlers, that it's people. But it can also come in through water, it can come in through um, the source, packaging and processing, or at retail. Um, and source tracking is being used to answer these kind of questions. And I think a lot of times the reason that viruses have been underused is because they're more difficult to culture. And some of them can't be cultured at all. They're a lot more difficult to recover from the environment. But with um, the advent of molecular methods, we're now kind of, a lot of those issues are being addressed. Um, but they do cause problems. And as you can see here, so this is um, percentage of foodborne outbreaks and illnesses associated with produce. So 43% of all norovirus outbreaks are associated with produce. And it's even higher for other viruses. 65% of all foodborne outbreaks of other viruses are associated with produce. So you think in produce, irrigation water is a big factor. Um, noroviruses specifically are the principal cause outbreaks of gastroenteritis. They're not very, I mean, they're not going to kill you, but they're going to make you feel like you want to die. So there's not a lot of issues with, you know, mortality, but it's something that can definitely be very unpleasant. And with norovirus, it's very easy to spread from person to person. So once one person gets it, especially, you know, large groups, very easy for it to spread. Um, but genotyping has come a long way um, where they've now identified different genotypes that are responsible for disease in humans. So you could take an environmental sample test for it and know, you know, is this the type that usually shows up in humans? Because I'll show on the next slide that it, it's evident in a large population of different um, organisms. And then genotype 2.4 is responsible for the majority of outbreaks. This is the one that easily spreads in large groups. I don't want to say conferences, but they're open. <laughs> so uh, this is just showing genetic classification of noroviruses. You can see uh, this one here is the main one that's known for you know large scale outbreaks. This is human and swine group, human group. There's also bovine group, human, and murine group. And this just shows um, 
the regions for typing that you can determine these genotypes. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that one of our graduate students in our laboratory, Dave Prince, has done with viral indicators in um, salads. So uh, switching over, staying on the virus topic, but switching over to colophages, um, the commonly used indicator organisms, uh, viruses that infect E. coli, and some of the specific types of colophages show source specificity when used. And this is kind of just listing um, the different types. So uh, Dave did a study where he collected um, virus, or sorry, not virus samples, salad samples from different restaurants in the um, Bryan College Station area. Um, and he analyzed these and uh, extracted the phages, and the phages were genotyped to determine the source specificity. And um, I wanted to point out that this is a really good example of method adaptation, and that this method that we use, or that he used, is one that was originally developed for water, but that we've kind of taken and adapted it for a food product. As far as food products go, salads with lettuce, spinach, are pretty easy to work with compared to, you know, like hamburger or something like that. So of uh, 200 house and specialty salad samples, 21.5% uh, were colophage positive. And of the ones that were genotyped, um, one was positive for genotype 1 and five were positive for genotype 2, uh, which sort of suggests that in this case, the main contributor to the fecal contamination in the salads was human source, so a handler or um, a processor. But it just kind of shows how these kind of methods that have been used for source tracking can be adapted for food products. So the last thing that I just kind of want to bring up as we're closing up is this idea of what are significant organisms. So when we're talking about source tracking, we're just talking about determining the sources of fecal contamination in water, in soil, in, you know, in food, even to some degree. Um, so the organisms that are targeted are usually pathogens or fecal indicators, but um, there's a certain set of organisms that are used, and I'm just kind of curious, why are those organisms chosen and not others? So as an example, I have here some work that um, I actually did uh, during my undergraduate. So this is bacterial genera detected um, during, so this is a metagenomic analysis, fire sequencing of ground beef. So you can see here, variety of organisms. I didn't put species because that would have taken up like five or six <coughs> slides, but um, so you have here different organisms. And then if you compare of those organisms, which one are commonly found in the human gut? So you can see that we have some that are currently being used. You know, we have Bacteroides is commonly uh, so E. coli, um, Clostridium, Enterococcus. But then there's also a variety of organisms that we don't really have currently have any use for. So it just kind of brings up the question of, you know, is there something that maybe we could learn from these other organisms? And as these metagenomic tools and molecular tools develop, I think we're going to realize that there's a whole lot of other organisms that we haven't really looked at. Of those, some of those would be found in cattle, pigs? Right. I mean, there's obviously crossover. you could do an analysis with exactly all of those. I just did human because that was what was easy to fit. All right, so in conclusion, um, a lot of the source tracking field in foods has been driven by regulations, the testing methods, the standardized methods, the agencies. Um, viruses play a very important role, and they're just kind of starting to be developed in the area. And um, as I showed you in the last slide, uh, I think we need to ask some questions about how we choose the organisms that we use to derive information from. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I had a quick question on the, uh, you know, on the surface water quality standards. You know, it goes back to the a lot of it goes back to data that's collected in the ground.